Welcome everybody to our um, format lecture series. My name is Elena Manferdini. I'm the graduate chair um, here at SciArc. And today we have a guest uh, speaking to all of us, Matt Tchaikovsky. Uh, Matt is a friend and a collaborator. We met a few years back at Greg Lynn's office where he was the creative force behind the dream sequence in Steven Spielberg Minority Report. Um, Matt is a designer, a filmmaker, a storyteller. I think he's curious, um, creative. He has infinite stamina. Uh, you know, he's also a father of two beautiful twin daughters. So you have to be that, I think, right now. And also an incredible charisma. Um, I think Matt moves uh, across industries, art forms, and always is able to create work that changes the way people see and engage the world. I think that's what he does at best. Um, it, it kind of tries to create new ways uh, for people to experience a story, moving us closer to a deeper understanding of each other and ourselves. Uh, he has collaborated with numerous brands and corporations, cultural and civic entities. He has a very long resume and he will show us some of his work in general. Um, and I think he, what he brings is always this dynamic, deeply human perspective to a global audience in all his work. And specifically, I thought his work meant um, a, a, a lot for our lecture series, which is called Expanding the Archives, because he did um, one piece for the show Speechless, which was a group exhibition uh, organized by the Dallas Museum of Art, where he produced uh, a piece that we'll see today. Um, it was a hybrid video and AI, and I think it was a special piece that I think has a lot to do with what we're talking in this lecture series, which is uh, what are the archives? What are the formats uh, that we use to archive? And how do we understand each other? And so I'm gonna leave the microphone to Matt. Welcome to SciArc. It's great to have you here. Great to be here. Great to be back. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I'm excited because like, like Elena mentioned, I think, you know, not only has my work moved across a variety of different disciplines, but most recently it was creating a project that converged both video and AI and natural language processing to really reimagine or to use our archive as it stands in the moment and reimagine language through that. Um, so I figured I would walk a little bit through, there we go, um, introduce you guys a little bit to myself um, you know, first and foremost, you know, I, I create many things. Um, I feel like the thing that connects across all of that is really a curiosity as a filmmaker, as a designer, as a storyteller for the space that's in between things. Um, and, and really what that means for me is everything from each other, spaces between each other, our ideas, our views, our worlds. Um, and, and, I, I hope that when I create my work really empowers movement into those spaces, those spaces in between. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an example of it as I walk through my work, but um, at the end of the day, I feel like while we often create for a destination, it's those moments in between in those transitional spaces, which is where the depth of the human experience comes alive. Um, so let me give you a little bit of sense of who I am. I figured the good place to start would be wh who I am in the archive at the moment. Um, which is a funny conversation as a filmmaker who often finds himself now being hired to create content, um, literally the content of an archive. Um, rolling all the way back, I mean, as a filmmaker, this is a film I directed called Lies and Alibis. Um, it's now living in the archive on Amazon and iTunes and other things like that. Um, Sometimes the archive for that is constantly changing. Um, I think it was on Netflix. It's no longer anymore when I tried to do it for this thing. So who knows? Um, I also years ago created the dream sequences for Minority Report. And the idea behind this early on, it was about a year long assignment, but it was how do we visualize memories? Um, what does a dream look like? Um, and in the instance of the film, uh, there are three precogs who see the future. Um, and how do three memories come together and how do they overlap? And, and then ultimately, how is that analyzed by Tom Cruise in the film um, in a way that's both intuitive and cinematic? Um, we also created the Hall of Containment, um, which is the prison. And we, so we, I think we murdered 30 people um, and filmed it so that it could exist in the, the archive of 
of death and murder that had yet to happen in the future of this film. Um, we just came across the 15 year anniversary for that. Um, and so if you guys are interested in a little bit more of the work that I did, Vice News did a spot on that um, and kind of reviewed how we did at predicting the future. Um, here's just an example of some of the stills The stuff on the bottom are the mock-ups that we created to pitch the idea of what was ultimately in it. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but this stuff. I'm used to, I keep wanting to ask if there are any questions, but I'm going to forget that for now. <laughs> um, this is something I worked on with Elena, and this is, you know, a longtime collaborator of ours was a company called Furminish, and they're a fragrance and flavors company who creates perfumes and, and the flavors of a lot of the things that you eat um, that aren't grown in the world. Um, and one of the things that they were interested in doing was figuring out a way to explore scent in a new way um, and how we can engage the world through scent in, in different and inspiring ways. And so that ultimately became a pop-up perfume museum in New York City called the Sensorium. This is an example of one of the interaction points there. We created um, custom technology that was inside this 3D printed orb that you see here that measures how you sniff. Um, and we use that data to play back um, the dreams that the perfumer was imagining as they created the fragrance they were sniffing. Here's another space. This, this space brought together and, and was transformed through projection. Um, it moved through chapters in a linear way that walked through the six ideas of first scent. What was unique and cool about this project for us and for me was that we really worked hand in hand with the perfumers as they were thinking about what fragrance art pieces to create. We were thinking about how to bring those stories to life. Um, and so working with them to visualize the invisible and, and put stories to just ideas that they had um, or emotions that they felt was, was a pretty magical experience for us. So this, this room here captures a perfumer's first memory of scent. Everything from summer vacation to the first scent in the morning when you wake up at 6.01 a.m. to bacons and, bacon and biscuits was another one. Um, this is the Lucid Dreams room that I was mentioning earlier where each one of those kiosk orbs um, contains a special fragrance that a perfumer created. And what is projected in front of you is the visualization of that. And that visualization is created procedurally um, this video probably won't play smooth, but it'll give you a sense of what it felt like. Um, each of these films was created procedurally based on how somebody sniffed the fragrance. We used a bunch of custom technology to measure that. Um, and, you know, we worked with the perfume around the narrative of the fragrance. And, and when creating a fragrance, there's ideas like sillage, which is basically the architectural space of the fragrance. If you walk through a room, what's the tale of the frag that the fragrance leaves as you walk through that room? Um, talk to them about all those kinds of things and what elements would be a part of their dream. And, and we use the data of the sniff to reassemble those into new narratives in front of you as you sniffed. Basically the flower bloomed based on how you were sniffing it. Um, show this just to sort of talk a little bit about the cross-disciplinary nature of the studio. I mean, you know, I call myself a filmmaker and a designer, but I think there's probably a lot more hyphens out there in the world as it relates to me. And, and one of the things that my studio is focused on is really, like I mentioned, you know, moving audiences into new places. And, and we rarely think about what the format is first. Um, and sometimes it ends up as, you know, a film. Sometimes it ends up as something that we're scripting. Sometimes it ends up as a documentary, as you'll see, or sometimes it ends up like an experience like this where we have to create the technology to actually accomplish the experience that we want. That rendering down below, Atelier Manfredini. <laughs> um, these are an example of Topper, an example of all of the fragrance testers as we were working with the perfumers on their ideas and sending them our stuff. <clears throat> Moving on, this is a project that we did with the MIT Media Lab called Death and the Powers. Um, we created all the digital media content for, for an opera, a live performance. Um, and, and basically the gist of it is in the first scene of the opera, this guy that you see, Simon Powers, who's the richest man in the world and lover of money and poetry, I believe was his bio. Um, he dies in front of us in the first five minutes of the opera and then merges with a computer system that he joined or that he created. Um, now, 
he spends the rest of the opera trying to convince his family to join him in the system, right? This computer system. So our, our assignment really on this, coming back to the theme of the archive was, um, you know, what does he take with him? What is his consciousness represent um, in the digital space once he gives up meat space? Um, so what you see here is um, an image of the download when, you know, after he became a part of the, the digital space, he was downloaded onto the stage where he could uh, perform the rest of the opera um, as a digital being um, on three 15 foot tall video walls. Um, what was a unique challenge to this was the video walls. The resolution on the video walls is actually 150 pixels tall, which is, I don't know, at this point, a fraction of what the iPhone is. Um, so there was a challenge around that, which was really interesting because it allowed us to become a bit more expressive than maybe literal. Um, so the kinds of things that we think about, you know, what are the things that, that you would carry over from your consciousness into the digital system? What would you leave behind from your physical self? Um, and then how would we use them when we were in there? You know, so he had access, the things that we created where he had access to his memories um, and he used those to manipulate his family as he was trying to bring them over into the digital. Um, he had access to graphics and text and the kinds of things that a web browser can use to express themselves. Um, things that he would pull from the archive of the internet in any given moment, current events, news headlines. Um, and so this toolkit of parts that we created um, was used every single night in a different way. It was sort of an instrument in a way. Um, here's an example where he's using memories to seduce his wife. You know, what was interesting about it for me from a filmmaking standpoint or even a design standpoint is I'd never done live performance before. Um, and the evolution of what this thing is that we created was truly different from one night to the next, not just in minor fluctuations on how the actors performed it, but the design of a live performance with the director and the rest of the team is if they feel like a joke isn't landing or something isn't working, they can morph that over the course of the show. And so what we created needed to really be a database or a toolkit that could be um, played almost like a piano. Um, last bit of historical stuff I wanted to share was this series that we created, uh, 32 episode documentary series about the impact that real people are having on the state of California. Um, and the reason I mentioned this is because I think so often when we work with partners, um, they're drawn to the technology and they're drawn to the slick stuff, but I'm just as interested in the spaces in between people and the ideas of real people and telling those stories in interesting ways. Um, so we've shot over a hundred short documentaries over the years, um, always focused on people that are trying to change the world and doing amazing things. Um, this is a still from a doc we did on somebody searching for other planets for us to live on. Um, we were swam with dolphins. Um, this is the Sierra Nevadas. Um, I'll show you next. I'm not sure how loud the sound will be, so I'll wait to hit play on it. But one of the things that El and I and I had spoke about in regards to my work was a documentary we did with a deaf professor professor of linguistics at UC Berkeley. Um, and so the documentary was all done in sign language. Um, so I had to direct with a translator through sign language, and he was signing, and and Patrick was signing back to me in sign language. Um, but it really sort of set the themes of some work that followed, including the piece that I'll share with you that we did for the Dallas Museum of Art, which was around how do you express yourself without using, in quotes, words. Um, so again, all this stuff you guys can find it on the website. I'm happy to share links in the chat after in the Q&A if anybody's interested. Um, but I think, you know, what he's exploring and through this documentary is the idea of a universal language. Um, particularly in the context of somebody who sees the world from a different perspective um, or experiences the world from a different perspective. So with that, that's sort of me in the archive, I guess I was going to say historically, but I suppose it's all present tense as well, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, so when originally the idea of expanding the archive came up, um, there were a couple things that I was immediately drawn to that connected over to the work that I'm exploring at the moment. Um, and the first idea is this idea of, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves um, and the concept that, you know, really the history that we write is rarely about reporting the facts. It's much more about shaping belief. Um, and this particularly, I think, holds true the further back you go, right? Um, and it makes me wonder if, our archives as we now witness them as these digital living things are any different. Um, I think there's a perception that 
um, both history um, and what we find on the internet is a collection of objects and facts that can be interpreted depending on what you're seeing. But I think as we're all has been really made clear in the past several years, that's, it's not just what's in the archive, but it's how the archive is organizing it and making those connections that is shaping that truth. Um, narrative autocorrect was something else that I think about a lot. Um, how is our technology changing our stories and, and above and beyond that, the stories that we have access to, right? So this connects over to my film that's no longer on Netflix, but it's on Amazon uh, for whatever reason. Um, and just in that stupid, silly example, you know, you can apply that thought across a lot more important ideas. Um, third idea was, was this, the thing between the things, which is something, as you heard, I think about a lot. Um, I think, you know, until recently, you know, our archive was, could have been seen by most people as a passive collection of objects, um, an archive of just things in quote contents, um, that, that sits there and is passive, but now it's truly in, in every single way, an active network of relationships, right? Our archives are now telling stories back to us. Um, and the relationship between this image and that image is being reformed um, by the powers that be, by our search history, by maybe where we're standing in the world and where we're searching for these things, particularly when you're thinking about the internet. Um, and so I think the story of the archive really becomes about the connections between the nodes. This is something that, you know, is interesting to me as a documentary filmmaker when I wear that hat, which is this idea of the more facts, the less truth, right? Um, what's interesting to me is particularly in the context of the project that you'll see that I'm about to show you is this idea of, you know, can we still find ourselves in the archive, right? If the presumption is that our history is there for us to learn from and move forward um, and show and orient ourselves as to where we are in the world next to the things that have happened. Um, as our archive becomes everything, um, as it contains everything about us personally and everything that's happening in the world, are we still capable of even finding ourselves in it, right? The truth of ourselves in it. Um, I think that's, you know, that's something I think about a lot, particularly with my work where I feel like humanity and the human being is always at the center of it. So that's just generally the broad strokes on kind of the ideas that are rattling around my head and the ideas I think that connect over to some of the themes of the series. So I wanted to focus a little bit on language as archive because that's something I had spent the last couple of years exploring directly through this work that I created for the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, the, the piece is called Glyph um, and it was a part of a group exhibition called Speechless um, that was put on by the Dallas Museum of Art and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. Um, this is just a screen capture and, and don't worry, I, I cycle back to a lot of this stuff as I sort of set it up a little bit more. Um, but this is a screen capture of the gallery space. Um, here's a video of, of the work in space that playing. Anyway, um, so at, at the highest level, you know, Glyph uses natural language processing, AI in some versions, to translate spoken word into a new visual language um, that's made only of images and it does this in real time. Um, and so each word that's spoken is replaced with an image search of the internet in real time. Um, the most popular image for that word at that moment on the internet is what is used. Um, and so the language is alive, right? It's evolving at the speed of culture. Um, sometimes it gets it wrong. And so it puts weird things up and sometimes it can't find an image just like everything else in our digital life at times. Um, and I'll talk through the beats that inspired and drove this work. Um, but at the end of the day, it was really built and designed and thought of and imagined across the backdrop of this show called Speechless, uh, which was a group exhibition, like I mentioned. And the, the idea of this show was really to bring together designers of different backgrounds to consider how we connect with each other um, and explore new perspectives on communication, right? Beyond speech and words. Um, for me, it was an opportunity to reconsider how we find empathy in the modern moment, right? So how do we create a physical experience that people can connect over and connect with each other over? Um, I think one of the unique things about this project um, through the vision of the curator was that all of the designers were brought together a year in advance of the actual show um, as a part of the think tank to 
talk and explore as creators how we express ourselves as as master communicators how we consider communication and how that comes into play with the stuff that we make every single day and what we do right so as we're creating a show for the public to explore this how do us as designers and artists and creators explore this um that's unique in general for a museum show but i think what was especially interesting to me about that was that one i think so much of my craft is about language and words particularly when it lands on the filmmaking side of things um, and so much of theirs, the other designers in the show, wasn't, right? They're creating, in many instances, things that to express ideas and emotions that they can't express with words. Um, and so there was a really interesting juxtaposition there. I think beyond that, as a storyteller, I was also able to explore their perspectives on expression as artists as a part of my project, right? Um, because we got together a year in advance, I could actually work with them and think about how to incorporate the expert communication that they were exploring into the presentation for what the audience would be. Um, so it was an opportunity to celebrate their artistic expression without words as a part of my work. Um, and so as I began to launch off into what I wanted to create for it, that sort of was the starting point. Those are the things that I was thinking about. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, really what was central to what I wanted to do was to create um, a new universal language, right? If the show's about speechless, um, I feel like so often, particularly now, we, our lives and ourselves are so hung up on words, right? Particularly in this digital space where we're getting auto-corrected and we're texting and emailing and all this other junk that's happening that is supposedly helping us communicate. It opens up so many potential opportunities for miscommunication. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the idea that words are weapons, they're sharp, precise, they're the kinds of things that everybody feels pretty clear on. They know what it means. Um, but in reality, the concept of language in this moment, particularly, but also all the way back across time is soft and alive, right? There are constantly new words and constantly new words of ways of communicating that are blending into what we consider ourselves, consider as our communication stream. Um, so I really wanted to create something in this exhibition that moved us away from the sharpness of words and really created a space that allows us to celebrate the fluidity of language um, and, and hopefully empower people to sort of stand within this and open themselves up to reinterpretation um, and connecting with each other around this thing that I created. Um, for me, like I mentioned, the anchor in that really was being a part of these early conversations um, with the other artists and designers and, and, you know, somewhere between, you know, every conversation between what the speaker is saying and what the listener is hearing, there's a transformation of meaning around what's happening, right? So hovering between all of us, there's this idea that's coming across the expanse that is morphing along the way. Um, and, and that moment in the middle where that meaning changes hands whatever I said has been interpreted and now all of a sudden has become something else, right? That's the fluidity that I was thinking about. Um, and so I wanted to create a space around that inflection point with Glyph. Um, and I wanted to really kind of zoom in on that moment and I wanted to expand it into the space, um, the size of a museum gallery. Um, and so there were really two paths for me to explore, right? I mean, the first of which was, let's think about how we capture this idea of a conversation. Um, and so as a filmmaker, this is a still from, my film and, and on the right is the literal documentation from a script supervisor on how you document filming a conversation, right? Um, and the different angles that you would capture to actually accomplish this. Um, you know, as a filmmaker, I think about how we're used to experiencing language either cinematically, um, you know, or, or cinematically, you know, or how we tell stories with language. And, and from a cinematic standpoint, you're always on the outside, right? You're always looking in. Um, there's cinematic attempts and ways to edit and ways to shoot that bring an audience into that inside of a theater or one watching a film over the shoulder, you know, clean shots on the face, things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still viewing it from, from this perspective that's up, which is outside looking in. Um, and I think that's in some ways a part of the problem with, with our current culture, right? Everything is happening so fast and communication happens so seamlessly across our technology that we rarely have the opportunity to sort of step inside the stream and understand where that meaning is shifting. And that's what I wanted to focus on. So 
with this idea, how do we capture a conversation between the designers in the show uh, in a way that doesn't feel like this, but is a way that translates over into a gallery space that allows you to step into it as opposed to watch it from the outside. So we created a new way of filming that. Um, and this is some, a piece of technology that we had used once before in a single direction, but we morphed that into doing two directions. So really what this allowed us to do using two cameras and two teleprompters effectively and, a couple, and some live streaming technology, create what now, two years later, I guess, after we've all living our lives through Zoom, what is a really fancy Zoom setup. Um, but effectively what this allowed us to do was put here, as you see, an artist on the left and an artist on the right, and they can have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation. And the thing that is directly in between them, smack in the middle, is our camera technology that's capturing it. So we're filming at that moment of inflection point. Um, and what this allows us to capture is something like this, right? So the person on the right is speaking to the person on the left and we're getting him listening live and we're getting her speaking live and we're getting direct, they have direct eye contact through the conversation um, and we're actually getting both sides of it. So again, you know, Zoom existed, but this was attempting to sort of bring that into a physical space. And the way the setup worked was really allowed for you know, people forget that they're being filmed across this process. And so you get really candid interviews. And so I brought together all of the designers from the exhibition back into the gallery space that the show would be in in the coming months um, after about a year of their exploration and a year of their process to talk through, you know, now as they were sort of embarking on these projects and working through what to create around this idea of expression and speechless, um, you know, what are they exploring? What are they thinking about in that moment? Um, and those conversations were interesting to me on a couple levels. One, I, that's always the thing that draws me in as a filmmaker and a storyteller. When I go to museums, I'm always interested in the things that talk about what the artist was doing in that moment in their life or what they were exploring. And so I wanted to bring that to the audience in the context of speechless. Um, but it was also an opportunity for me to create some source material that ultimately my software could use to then translate over time. Um, you know, so the source material was this where, you know, they're making direct eye contact with us, even though in the real space, they're separate. But we did that so that it could become this. Right. So then the left side of the space, um, the person on the left side is talking to the person on the right side with eye contact. And when you walk into the gallery, you're literally walking into where that hexagon is. You're walking in between them. And so you're directly in the middle of the communication stream. Um, and this really set the stage for the third piece, which I'll walk through, which is the translation and how that existed. But it also allowed everybody who walked into the gallery to be disoriented in a way so that we could reorient them back into this world. Here's just a bit of, here's how it looked in the space. Um, and again, I'll come back through a lot of this, but it gives you a feel of sort of what, what it felt like. Um, everybody was sized in the projection to be just a little bit bigger than human, but eye level was consistent with where you would stand more or less in space. And the stream you'll see there happening in the middle is happening live. So every word that's said is finding its way into the translation stream. You know, I think just from a filmmaking standpoint, before I get into the, the what the software was attempting to bring to the experience, you know, I think one of the most interesting discoveries just when thinking about a conversation um, that I found in the process of filming these conversations this way and projecting them into the space in this way um, was even without the translation, um, what we found was that when somebody walked into it, more often than not, they're listening, obviously, to what the person is saying, but they're watching the person who's listening. Um, and from a filmmaking standpoint, this was interesting to me because what it began to sort of communicate was how much of the empathy in that exchange between us, the two of us in the real world or in this conversation, is actually coming from the person who's receiving it. Um, and there are instances where you could actually turn off the audio and not hear what's being said and really get a sense of the vibe of the conversation just based off of how the person was listening to them. Um, and it was a really subtle and small thing, but it was definitely an idea, particularly as we think about how you communicate with each other without using words. Um, it was a really interesting reveal in regards to how that dynamic actually works and how 
we find humanity in this communication stream that's heading back and forth between us and, and how we're both actually a part of it in a really interesting way, both being the speaker and the listener. So let's talk a little bit about how to create, how we embarked on trying to capture the fluidity of language through code. Um, so, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to me was, you know, the curator was, was driven by how do you remove words from the equation? And so, you know, coming back to some of my early inspiration around the strictness and the, the rigidness of words and the meaning of words and how it, it feels, I felt like it confines us into a certain kind of interpretation in space. I was interested in what happens when we shift this over to another medium like images. Um, and what happens when we move over to a visual space? So this is a screen from um, the studio on one of our tests where it's, we're using our API and it is, the software is basically grabbing the word things and trying to find the most trending image for it at the moment. And it's finding some Dior sneakers, probably around a thousand bucks. Um, and then finding a cat with sunglasses that as for the word interesting. Um, and this is how we began. We began a couple words at a time. Um, and it was an interesting breakthrough as we began to sort of see how it works because it was quirky and sometimes it was funny, but in, even in the context of something like this, um, it, was, it was magical to watch it happen as somebody spoke into a microphone and these things were generated in real time, um, but it wasn't quite transcendent, right? Um, a lot of the images were stock images like the cat one that you saw, um, and a lot of them were overly simplified. Um, I was kind of worried early on that we were sort of creating a quirky, meaningless machine, right? We're gonna take whatever you say and we're gonna kind of make it generic. Um, now, that in itself, I think, is an interesting commentary on what our technology is doing to us um, and how we communicate. Um, because in reality, all this was doing, it's not like we were telling it what to pick, it was choosing what our technology would pick for this. Um, but it wasn't quite the experience we were going for, right? Like the idea of, rising up and finding this moment in the middle where we have this inflection point of translation where we as humans there wasn't going to come from just one image or two image at a time based on what we were learning um but as we began to widen the lens and we began to i guess in a way let this stream right so let the flow of information go beyond just one at a time um we began to see you know we began to use more words across so we began to see what it would do more globally, um, we began to understand it in a new way. And this is just an image from inside the studio where we're using a microphone um, to pick up um, a speaker of sound of, of words that, were, that we were speaking. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, it, as the stream was happening and this was flowing by you, you know, it would be funny and profound. And sometimes the word just became Justin Bieber. Um, or there would be broken links for seemingly simple ideas, like something like we would all find pretty universal in regards to an image or the, the software couldn't find it for some reason. Um, or sometimes it would get hung up on one image over and over again. And in the context of the exhibition where this was running every day, like for weeks, you know, it would use the upcoming movie poster for the movie it for the word it every time somebody said it and it would not get off of it. <laughs> um, and it began to sort of reveal the threads of, of sort of how we communicate and get tie into some ideas around what actually make us human, right? A lot of those things are things I think that um, we could be criticized for as human beings. Um, sometimes it moved fast, sometimes it moved slow. Sometimes the images were funny, sometimes they were serious. Um, but when viewed in motion, like you see here, um, it really captured this humanity that translates broke through the screen um in a way that felt unique and and began to sort of move past what was happening when it was single images and began to feel like a stream that we were standing in the middle of there are these moments where you can come into someone's life and create this really special moment and so this is some of the interview footage that we filmed that we were using as the source material for the translation. And this is how it came to life in the exhibition, um, as opposed to having an open mic. Um, the 
study used basically a seven minute conversation that I had filmed on loop. Um, and the reason that was interesting was because we could take the same set of words in the same conversation that took seven minutes across six different designers um, and play that on loop and, and see how the translation evolved over time. Um, I think the game really changed for us the moment we exploded the layers um, and we began to think about it as that physical space that we were searching for early on. Where on the left of the screen is a person on the right and then in the center, literally where this stream is spanning the space, um, you're getting the stream of, 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 of words being translated in front of you. So you stand there and you're hearing it come out of their mouths as it forms on the screen. Um, I think that's really when everything changed for us. And we created an opportunity, not just to sort of engage with this intellectually, but to stand outside of ourselves and witness these sort of stories that we're telling ourselves in a way, right? We created a platform that allowed the audience to experience language as a dynamic stream, like literally changing every single instant based on, you know, humanities and our technologies, global preferences, right? We created a lens into this exact moment where the ownership of a word changes hands. You're standing there at that exact inflection point as it changes. Um, and we're not only doing that between the speaker and the listener, but we're doing that for the audience that's standing there in the space. Um, and, you know, we got some really amazing moments as this sort of meaning morphed in front of people um, by, you know, I think the key was separating these parts into the physical and we created this space where that fleeting moment of that exchange could be held and experienced with um, with other people. Um, you know, so we got things like, this is just this cell phone video of, of how it was working. You know, like, you know, there were two women standing in the space who didn't know each other and one image came up and somebody said, oh my God, I would have never picked that for that if I said that. And the other person said, oh, wow, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, and so it really created this moment where people could sort of stand outside themselves and stand outside how we communicate to find empathy and share that space with other people. Um, that's when it became less about meaning and more became about finding a shared understanding. I'm happy to share any of these links with folks after, I'm sure this isn't playing back well for anybody. Um, but, you know, so that's what the piece was in the moment. But I think what's most interesting to me about Glyph is what it is and has been every moment since we've created it, right? Um, since this thing was live, um, I don't know how interruptive this audio is. Hold on. Yeah, so I'll just let it stop. Um, since it was live, I mean, basically every single time that the text was spoken, um, it was researching and so for images and attempting to find the most trending image or the most relevant image um, amongst our global archive of the internet at that moment. And so in our demos, you know, if somebody said gray sky on any given day, a stock image of a gray sky could come up. But on the day that Notre Dame was burning as we were doing this, that would be the image of the day. And so it was constantly moving between generic and specific and constantly evolving. And, and what it was in January was different from what it was in February. Um, and, and for me, that is what's most interesting about the piece. And that's really what I'm thinking about next um, is how do we embrace that fluidity and the documentation of how language is morphing based off of our global archive? You know, I mean, the simple thought is, you know, how does, you know, if you can imagine when this thing shut down in early 2020, you know, like what the idea of an election would be or an uprising would be or, or pandemic, you know, how, what is, what does a pandemic look like in January, 2020, as opposed to February, 2020 or March or a year later now. Um, and when you think about it in that context, you know, let alone when you embrace the technology thinking for a moment and you think about the kind of filters that, an image search can be influenced by, right? Be it what platform you're on, be it Facebook or Google or your or your own personal search history or, or what country you're in, right? Um, the idea of China banning most recently the image of, um, you know, the, the famous tank image um, on the anniversary this past weekend. 
um, you begin to see how this archive is changing, not just over time, but based off of access to it and who's controlling that and things like censorship. Um, so I grabbed some of the results of what Glyph was doing since the show changed um, and just wanted to share some of sort of how it was seeing the word pandemic from February 2020 until yesterday. And so in February 2020, it was still a pretty abstract concept to most of the world. And it was finding things like, you know, Hollywood's version of what a pandemic is. Um, towards the end of February, it began to find images like this from Wuhan. And Barcelona in March as the world began to shut down and things got crazy. To not surprisingly, the internet telling us the stock market is important. To our dear friend here. By the way, I can't believe, look at the typography on the word Washington. What a nightmare. Um, to April. Also in April, despite that, this. And this is all the software searching and trying to find an appropriate image for one word across time. Homeschooling. I think this is Brazil, I think. June. August, October, to being the word of the day, right? From a word that it was finding something for Contagion, the movie, to a year later or less than a year later. Empty schools in February, vaccine for all in April this year. To May, while we're all thankfully finding the ends in some way, this is India in May. You know, this was, I pulled this yesterday. This is what, this is the one, this is the image it found for pandemic yesterday. And so, you know, I think what was interesting to me about Glyph was it provided a new way for myself and hopefully the audience to begin to understand themselves inside the bigger picture of what this archive is, um, this archive of the human story. And I think it's becoming more and more difficult for us to find ourselves in it, right? And it comes back to some of the themes that I was mentioning earlier. Um, but I think that by creating empathetic engagements like Glyph, where we're analyzing those connections between um, and we're focusing on the changing landscape and the dynamic relationships between the nodes in the archive, it becomes less about the meaning of that node, right? And it becomes more about a place where we can together sort of uncover the richness of the human experience. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm ultimately interested in creating things where people lose themselves in it, right? Um, where they lose themselves in that moment and they find some understanding of this new space that I'm opening up, right? A different future. And the idea is that even if that's just for a second or a moment, if they walk into the gallery and they're only there for a minute or five minutes, hopefully, you know, they walk out and they look over their shoulder and they, they are a few steps further down the line towards the horizon, right? Towards the future. Um, I think that if we're creating experiences and in my own work, if I, what I hope for in the experiences that I create is that if I'm expanding these moments in between and allowing people to inhabit them, then I'm creating more opportunities for people to discover the richness in the human experience. Um, for me, you know, my process has always been in some way related to this, but I feel like the tendency as creatives and as creators is to often focus on creating the thing, right? Or the destination or the object. Um, but when our audience, our, the people who are experiencing our work in whatever it is, are often experiencing that thing or that destination as a transitional moment in their life, right? Um, there, it's not a destination for them, regardless. Well, hopefully not. Um, not a final destination for them. You know, but if we create and we design and we film or we engineer technology to create for that transitional moment, um, my hope is that it expands the space between, right? And we're creating more opportunities for us to connect and find empathy. And I think particularly in our current climate and our current world, that's one of the most important things I feel like we can do as creatives. That's it for me.
this is just going to go. Thank you, Matt, for the fantastic lecture. I um, would like to maybe open the microphone to the students if they have any question about what they've seen. And maybe meanwhile, while students are thinking about it, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question of what do you think is the future of the archive? I know that um, you've done minority report, which was somehow uh, the understanding of what in the future this information will be used for. Um, you've been a lot doing quite a bit of this speculative work. Can you imagine, you know, maybe two steps ahead of us, what the archive will be and what the consequences of the archives are? I mean, look, I mean, I, you know, I feel like the thing I'm drawn to the most is storytelling, right? So I think about um, the stories that we're telling about the archive. And, and I think more than ever, I think we're all super aware of the people that are telling the people that are telling the stories of our archives and shaping that. And so my, my hope is that in the future, um, that opportunity will be more equitable and we'll be more aware of how our archives are being shaped. Um, it, it feels like the archive itself is pretty all encompassing at this moment. So it's all gonna be about how we interpret what's in it. I don't know, I was, I was blown, I was surprised. A, I was worried at how dumb the results were in the beginning of, of Glyph. And I was like, this is just not like, and I, I was worried both A, because I thought the piece was gonna suck, but I was also worried because I was like, what does this say about us, right? Like this, we're using the same technology that is Siri, that is Alexa, that is speech to text on your phone, that is Google search. We're using all that same stuff. And if what it's doing is making what we mean so dumb and baseless, like what does the future for that communication look like for us? Um, but I was really surprised as we began to provide a new perspective into it, how it be could become a platform for us to better understand each other and to connect with each other. Um, so I think there is hope. I feel like I'm speaking into an empty void. <laughs> no, I know it's, it's difficult. It always feels like that. <laughs> It, Matt, I thought it was so fascinating how um, in Glyph, the, the viewer becomes the uh, receiver of, of the conversation. And so um, allowing the viewer to like sort of take on that role and how you were talking about this, how to sort of um, convey empathy. Um, I thought that was really powerful and you know, being simultaneously the viewer and, the, and then also part of the conversation um, was really interesting. And in, just in terms of like visually, like looking someone eye to eye. And so the image of the person um, speaking is actually speaking to you while they're actually speaking to someone else. Yeah. Um, I thought like being in that space was really interesting. And um, I guess my question is like, is as a viewer and as interpreters of the ar archive, like how do, how do you think, how, how does it manifest as something visual? You know, it's a, it's a kind of experience and it's a kind of thing out there, but how, how do you see that sort of um, becoming something visual um, without, without sort of, um, without sort of like um, trying to sort of put, understand all of these images in uh, like a, a mixed bag, right? Yeah. Can you see me okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry, my thing changed up, I couldn't tell, but I heard everything you said. Um, well, look, right, I mean, that was one of the things we explored, right? Was, was how do we, are we using software to create a expressionistic, expressionistic representation of what this should be? Or are we keeping our hands off of it? And are we just allowing it to be raw images and raw stream? Um, and I think in regards to Glyph, it was a conscious choice to go raw so that we could focus on, you know, the connections between and not necessarily how the technology 
you know, not, we're not, we weren't adding another layer of expression to it, right? We wanted to keep it sort of to the basic nodes of what was going on. So that was one thing for that. But I think the challenge in regards to visual expression is, especially in this day and age, everybody's coming at it from a completely different place, right? Um, and we're losing control of the experience and the on-ramp from which people step into it. So the moment you move out of a gallery space, Glyph struggles to exist, right? It's a much more different experience when I'm showing just one stream um, or it's presented in a new way. It was really created to exist in a singular way. And so my long-winded answer to sort of the question of, you know, how does this become, or how do we begin to think visually about this archive that could be so all-encompassing and massive is, you know, I begin to think about what's the point of engagement that, how do we shape the point of engagement that the audience is going to be launching it into, into it with? Um, and when we can control that and we can design that space like we did at the gallery, we have an opportunity to help. Um, people understand this experience in a new way because we're placing them in a certain point of view and we're opening up a portal for them to see it in a certain way. Um, the moment Glyph moves out of that space, it becomes a challenge for people to understand what's going on. Um, and I think that applies to how we visually express the archive in a bunch of other different areas. Um, you know, part of me as a designer hates the idea that it's just raw images. I feel like so much of what we see now in regards to the archive, be it Google image search or Amazon or whatever, feels user experience design, but not visually designed. Um, but I felt that there was a truth in that representation. And so we let it roll. Um, Matt, I was uh, like fascinated by many of the things which you run. Uh, shared with us. I was in one of the points you brought up was censorship, and um, my kind of experience of using um, just basic natural language processing, um, say uh, with like um, uh, uh, auto-generated subtitles, yeah. is that the first thing that tends to happen is that, that it generates something um, uh, like obscene, inappropriate, uh, offensive, misconstrued. And that there seems to be that initial confrontation with the Oracle is an experience of mistranslation yeah. and um, like non-dialogue. And so I wondered, first of all, uh, how did you deal with uh, censorship? But then also, is there a way in which it's actually in that miscommunication where a kind of potentiality is? I like this idea that the archive is a kind of Oracle, that it's like an alien consciousness that's either wiser or weirder than we are. And that with our kind of simple um, human modes of understanding and questioning, um, we might actually tap into a kind of uh, non-human consciousness that is uh, returns forms of ideas and language, which are, I don't know, in advance of, or weirder than, or, uh, and that I that out of that conversation comes something like truly strange and unusual, because I'm just imagining that in terms of the future of an archive within an architectural context, one can imagine uh, a kind of intercourse with a certain sort of architectural intelligence um, that might elicit, you know, strange new forms, whatever it is. Um, but that to get there, you would always have to go through, like all of the myths of consulting oracles, some really hellish place that's full of kind of demons and apparitions um, and, uh, you know, where censorship would become an issue. So I just, uh, yeah. you know, wanted to share that. I mean, there was such uh, obvious concern around the, you know, what, what is this thing going to say, right? Um, and I, ref I mean, we just couldn't do it, right? I mean, we could have turned on safe search, but I refused to do it, you know, I mean, and, and I think this, the idea of allowing it to interpret without any guardrails was important for us to just see what would happen. Now, I will say that in that context, everybody's worst fears did not come true, right? It did not have a porn day, um, which I was kind of hoping like, oh, shit, I'm getting emails on a Tuesday morning. Like, oh, my God, it's gone porn. Um, or, you know, it's gone Trump or it's gone whatever else could come up. Um, and we didn't find that that had happened. Um, 
so I, I don't know if that's encouraging or discouraging, um, but the Oracle is playing nice, at least for our version of it. Um, but I think, you know, when I think about that, that comes back to, you know, you think about all the digital ads that are being served to us on a daily basis based off of our search history. You know, I think the beauty of this was that, you know, the search history of what Glyph was doing was created from scratch. It was a completely new account. Um, and so it's not like it was, you know, a person's. And so it was starting fresh. And I think I'd be curious to see how the Oracle's tastes change over years of it existing in this world. Um, in regards to that space of the abstract, you know, I, I definitely, um, I mean, that was the magical moment, right? It was when sort of the text that was being said sort of was transformed from a sequence of words and a statement to something more like poetry, right? It's sort of like just the shifting of that format and what we were creating um, took people and the audience to a place of thinking about it more abstractly and from, you know, 30,000 feet. Um, and so I think that transformative moment of, um, the Oracle disassociating from our exact sort of archive of knowledge and beginning to present things to us that maybe are quirky or random or weird and us not understanding why it's doing that, I think really did open up opportunities for the humanity to come out and the connection to come out. Um, will that always be the case? I'm sure. I'm sure it's hard programmed into us as humans in some way to do that. Will that lead to our demise? Possibly. I wonder if this is the temporal, I know we have to leave, but the, I'm talking with one of the students about um, the archive in relation to the notion of space time. Yeah. And, um, you know, the temporal, and it sort of relates to John's point about censorship in the, the five second delay notion. Yeah. Right. And and wondering what kind of delay there was in in the response. Right. How many how many seconds or nanoseconds does it take for the translation or mistranslation to generate itself? And is there something interesting in that delay? Right. Yeah. In that space of the time. Yeah. I mean, just from a technical standpoint and from like yeah. a standpoint, um, you know, the early tests were like a five second delay and we got that down to somewhere between a second and two seconds. And, but, but honestly, the, from a audience, if an audience was inputting speech to it, five seconds was fine. I think we're used to our technology creating that empty space, right? Um, from an experience where you're standing there and it's streaming in front of you, that's where it was important. And you're not the one speaking, but it's translating when somebody else is speaking. It was important for that to be a little bit more of a tighter time, time bandwidth. But, but, to, but to the point you made about space time, I mean, what's really interesting to me is if I tried to go back today and recreate the image set from when it launched, um, I can't do it. I can't get those images anymore. Like they don't exist to me. I can't go into Google and type a date and say, find this image for that date, right? Across an archive of the scale of all of Google's image searches or all of what's happening on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's disturbing to me, right? I mean, this idea that, you know, I mean, A, iTunes is doing that with all of my music that wasn't just streamed on iTunes. It's erasing all of my cool stuff from before. But I think the archive is constantly overwriting what we thought was true at that moment. Um, and as time changes, so does the archive. And I think that's frightening. But maybe productive too. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. But I'm, by the way, I'm archiving the text. We have like, you know, nine months of that, of what that's doing. So if you ever want to know what's going on, feel free to reach out. That'd be really interesting. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the talk. Uh, I want to thank all the students who are being here today and the faculty. Um, and I'm sure that if there are other questions. Maybe you can put them in our chat in team and I'll try to get you in contact with Matt. Um, no students ask a question, so hopefully uh, those some thoughts uh, came about after seeing his piece for the uh, museum, uh, Glyph. It was fantastic to have you here, Matt. And um, Christy, do you? Oh, no, I was just 
get, getting ready to say a live thank you and goodbye. So he didn't feel unwelcome, but I, you, may do, you may do the closing, the, the, the closing words. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye thank bye. you, Elena. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Bye, Matt. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, everyone. Um, Cheers, Phil, everyone. I'm not sure if the recording might come to you um, since you're the host. If so, you could just forward it to John and I, and we'll put it on Teams. OK, great. OK, thanks, everyone. Don't.